early morning mood by showing all these uh, dreaded, uh, dreaded photographs to you. So let me start with a simple, nice and uh, nice story. We get a patient of cataract surgery. We do a proper evaluation of the patient, including posterior segment evaluation as well. And after that, even though the cataract surgery has excellent results, we make it a point to explain the surgery to the patient, what to expect, what not to expect, and also the potential risks that may include perforation, PC rent, nucleus drop, detachment, and of them, all those things we have explained. After that, as Dr. Satanshu has pointed out, to be very safe on the medical legal side, we've taken a proper consent from the patient as well. And then we take all the meticulous precautions, uh, follow all the checklists registered by Dr. Mathur, and do a meticulous surgery, do a good job. The patient gets good vision. The patient is happy. The patient is given glasses, whatever number is there, four weeks or five weeks after the surgery, and everything is fine. So we have a happy ending. So, and as they say, and they lived happily ever after. But wait, as Shah Rukh Khan said, the movie is still not over. You get a phone call about two months after the surgery from the patient saying, the doc, my vision has gone down. It may not be pain, but the vision has gone down after a successful uh, cataract surgery and a very successful rehabilitation of the patient. Now, that's when you have to start thinking about a potential complication of a late onset or a chronic uh, post-operative endophthalmitis. Now, what we understand is that this post-operative endophthalmitis, which happens late, is actually not exactly the same as an acute or subacute post-op end-off that we see. The, the pathogenesis is a bit different, the response is different, and the treatment modalities that you have to go for is also a bit different. So we have to see where all it differs, and that's the reason we are going to be discussing uh, this topic as a separate point. So it is very different from acute or subacute post-op end-off. The term was coined in 1986. And as uh, the clinical science has already been pointed out by Dr. Puneet, so I won't go too much into that, but it is basically a low-grade uveitis that may happen months or even years after the surgery. Now, there can be two types of late onset. One can be like blab-related, where the infection is entering later on. That behaves more like an acute post-op endophthalmitis of a very virulent kind, so I'm not going to be talking about that part. But the one that I'll be talking about is where the infection has gone in during the initial surgery, and, but the organism is very low-grade, uh, indolent kind of a bacteria or a fungus which manifests itself much later. And there's a whole lot of immune response that is there in this particular disease than a pure infective response. And that's the reason why these patients respond uh, very well to the steroids, the bacterial ones especially. And when, whenever you taper off the steroids, it tends to recur again and again. So there, the problem here is it's a low-grade, it is recurrent, and it responds initially to the uh, steroids as well. It involves mainly the anterior chamber and then progresses to the vitreous. Pain and discomfort may not be there, but decrease in vision is almost always there. All right? Uh, and as I said, the, for the bacterial cases, it may be steroid responsive initially, but recurs after medication tapering. But in case of uh, fungal, as we know, the steroids may actually worsen the disease. So that may be one of the dis uh, distinguishing factors in determining what is the cause there. Now, it is, uh, basically, it is an autoimmune reaction that happens to the bacteria and its antigens that are there in the, uh, lens mat, uh, in the, within the lens capsule. And because it is encapsulated inside, it is very difficult to eradicate as well. Now, though, uh, despite using each and every precaution, as Dr. Satanshu has pointed out, we all know that some degree of bacteria do enter the patient's eye. That happens mostly from the local bacterial flora. But our immune system is good to take care of those uh, bacterial invasion in most of the cases. But there is something that is there in some host characteristics where we are not able to take, that, uh, take care of that infection. Or sometimes the inoculum size may be more. Now, these are the two factors which are basically which determine whether the patient is going to have endophthalmitis or not. Because whatever said and done, some bacteria do enter the eye, but most of the times the, the patients take care of that. So, uh, P. acne actually stays in, uh, intracellular inside the monocytes and neutrophils. That's the reason why it is very difficult to eradicate uh, these, uh, the, these bacteria. The incidence of post-op endophthalmitis is fortunately very low, and that of chronic post-op endoph is even lower than the acute post-op endophthalmitis. One of these studies have reported as low as 0.017%, but still, uh, because the denominator is so high, we do so many cataract surgery, they still form a significant number. Of the microbiology, the most, of the most common organism is uh, propionobacterium acne, that is for about 50% of cases, followed by fungal, which are quite significant in our country, and uh, gram-positive uh, co uh, coagulase negative stuff uh, is the next. So these are the three main organisms that are there. Besides that, there may be some other organisms as well. So we should not uh, think that these are the only three possibilities. So a need of a uh, proper uh, culture is a must. So it basically sh shows a granulomatous uveitis with large uh, uh, KPs that are there. 
you may find a white intracapsular plaque uh, which is uh, uh, which is there in the within the capsular bag that is very highly indicative of propionobacterium acne and in case of fungal you may have a pearls on string or fluff balls uh, so that's very characteristic of fungal uh, kind of uh, endophthalmitis now the diagnosis is challenging because uh, it uh, it comes to you late and the, the cultures and other things take time to come in uh, but still we have to make sure that we try to make all the attempts to get to a diagnosis the causes uh, the, the differential diagnosis can be some other cause of uveitis for example lens induced uveitis or the iol which may not be placed properly and it is irritating the iris tissue or sympathetic ophthalmia and the treatment uh, protocols are very difficult to define because of very variable nature of the disease the options we can just give intraocular antibi intravitreal antibiotics uh, in the bag or uh, on, uh, only in the vitreous. We can do a pasplana vitrectomy with antibiotic or pasplana vitrectomy with partial uh, capsulectomy or a total removal of the IOL as well. So this is the level of aggression that we can go to and most of the cases need IOL uh, explant as well in these cases. Uh, Coming to fungal endophthalmitis, uh, just to briefly touch upon that, because I don't want to cover the whole of the thing in such a short time, just give some idea that uh, though it is rare in the Western world, but in our part of the world, it is uh, not so uncommon. We have got instances of more than uh, one-fifth of the cases may be fungal endophthalmitis. So we have to keep that in mind. Most of the cases are candida, and fungal endophthalmitis, again, is very difficult to treat, and uh, invariably, we have to resort to vitrectomy in these fungal endophthalmitis cases. Along with vitrectomy, we can give intravitreal amphotericin B or uh, voriconazole. Along with oral fluconazole or ketoconazole can be given. In cases of corneal involvement, we would like to add on some topical uh, antifungals as well. These doses we can get from the net, so we don't need to really remember these. But fluconazole and ketoconazole are the ones that are most commonly used for the oral uh, treatment. So the treatment, there is no standard management, but the current approach is that we do a thorough pastlana vitrectomy, not just the core vitrectomy, but we clear up as much of vitreous as possible. And then at the end of the surgery, we'll leave some amphotericin B or voriconazole, and the rest I told you. You may require a prolonged systemic treatment as well for these patients, so it's very important to get a proper clinical evaluation because these antifungals have a side effect as well. And so we have to make sure that the patient is systemically stable and is not having any complications of the uh, treatment that we are giving. Now, what after having gone through all the theory, now the bottom line is what do we gain out of this talk? So the next two minutes, I'll be just talking about the practical aspects of how I deal with this. So when you have a patient who calls you up, the doc, I, I'm not able to see very well, don't just brush it out. Just think of this as a possibility. Make sure you call the patient for a checkup. Don't say, okay, it might be a PCO, will be all right, or something like that. It might be an endophthalmitis, so make sure you call the patient for examination. Look for any other cause of vision loss or any undue inflammation that is there. If you find some IUL which is not properly placed, there's some iris irritation happening, then you know that's probably a non-infective cause. So have a proper examination. Look for any predisposing factor for endophthalmitis that may be there in that particular patient. Look for any sac uh, uh, infection or other thing. Diagnose or suspect endophthalmitis. Have a very high index of suspicion always. Don't err on the side of safety. Always err on the side of uh, endophthalmitis. And counsel the patient and the attendants. It is very difficult because when the patient is already, at the initial stage, patient is scared that surgery is happening, so he'll, he's prepared for the complication. When he comes after two months, you tell them there is a complication of surgery, it's very difficult to explain that to him. So you have to spend more time with the patient and always be truthful to the patient. Tell them that they have an infection, there's nothing wrong. We have done no wrong. Infections are a part of the game. Don't be very, don't be very defensive about it, but don't ever lie to the patient because you will land up in a soup otherwise. So besides the treatment that I'll be talking about, you have to make sure that you check the OT register for that particular day of surgery. Look at all the other patients that you operated on that particular day or, or on the days around that period. Contact those patients. Make sure they're doing well. If possible, call them for a follow-up because they may also be, there might be something wrong in your OT which has caused this infection. And these patients may, be, may have gone somewhere. So just make sure, uh, contact those patients that they're doing fine. Review if there was any change in OT practice that happened during that period. That's again where the record keeping is very important. You document everything that you're doing in your OT. So you know that, okay, at that time you've probably changed out a new brand of any irrigating fluid or something. So you can try to pinpoint where the problem happened. Uh, this thing becomes easier to do when in an acute end-off because the things are very recent. But in chronic end-off, it's about two months old. So make sure records are there so you can try to find out the cause if there is some problem in your OT. Document the case properly. And also make sure the previous documents are all okay because this case, again, may go to the court. So you have to make sure you, are, you, have cover, you are covering your base quite well. 
give a lot of chair time to the patient, explain to him, tell him the possibilities of even a surgery in the future or an explant of IUL in the future so that it doesn't come as a shock to him. Slowly prime the patient towards that. Be truthful and remember they would go for the second and third opinion so don't try to hide things from him. Be truthful and you will always have a good result as well as very peaceful uh, night's sleep. So the treatment options, as I said, are, these are the treatment options that are there in, uh, in this. So what I normally do, depending upon the severity of inflammation, in a mild case, I won't straight away jump in for a surgery. I will uh, give an intravitreal, uh, we'll do a sampling and give an intravitreal vancomycin alone. There's no need of giving a true cover for gram negative. Just vancomycin should be good enough. And give systemic steroids as well. Uh, and then you monitor the patient. In case the patient is not improving or worsening, you think of fungal, fungal endophthalmitis, you have to go in for the surgery anyway. If the patient is improving, then still maintain him on a very long follow-up because the patients have a very long, ten uh, a, a, a big tendency of recurrence again and again. And keep preparing the patient mentally for any possible need of surgery in the future because, you know, you have to keep that option in mind because recurrences are known to happen. Even, even if the patient has responded in the first go, tell him that he may recur and he may need a surgery later on. If the response is not adequate or worsening, don't hesitate for surgery. Be aggressive. Do capsulectomy if you go in for the surgery. Don't just do simple vitrectomy. Do a nice capsulectomy as much as you can and inject intravitreal uh, antibiotic also. If in doubt, don't hesitate to explant the IUL also. We can always put in a glued IUL or something later on. But uh, if, you, if in doubt, you can explant the IUL. If you feel it, you may manage without removing the IUL, you can always keep that as a second option. So you can go in again if you, if you feel the patient is recurring after that. And long-term follow-up is necessary because of for the recurrences, especially when you're going for conservative surgeries. The prognosis, uh, as we know, fungal infection is uh, having a worse prognosis than the bacterial infections do. And uh, the gram-positive have about 55% of patients have 612 or better vision at the end of the treatment. So it's not as bad. And the recurrence is more common with more conservative approach. So when you're giving only intravitreal antibiotics, it's 690%. But it comes down to 5% when you're doing an aggressive surgery where you're explanting the IOL as well. So depending upon the severity, don't hesitate to be more aggressive towards the patient. So to conclude, you have to recognize the clinical features at the earliest, institute prompt and aggressive therapy, and maintain a long-term follow-up. Thank you.